during Revelation. We have one more person just getting her seat and we'll be ready to go. It's been a busy day, but God is good. He's brought us all back here. And we're looking forward once again to getting a blessing through Pastor Vic as he opens the book of Revelation. So as we prepare to receive the message this evening, I invite you to bow your heads with me as we pray. Oh God, our loving Father, we thank you for revealing your truth to us. We ask once again that as we enter into this time of study that you be our teacher and guide, that through your Holy Spirit, you may open our hearts and minds to receive the message that you have for us this evening. And may it not simply inform our minds, but may it transform our hearts so that we can become more like Jesus. So we thank you in advance for the miracles that you're going to be working in our midst today as we surrender to your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, it's been a busy day for Pastor Vic, too, and he's still working on his mic there, but I think we're ready. Is the mic on, or is it kind of low? It seems like it's on. It's just not on loud. Is that better? Okay, okay. Well, good evening. <laughs> so, I hope that you had a good day today. Uh, like Pastor Ramon said, it's been a busy day for us. But uh, we had some meetings to go to, but praise the Lord, we made it back in time to be able to share God's word. You know, I, I was sad um, last night and this morning, you probably read the news about a man who went into the supermarket in Buffalo, did you see that in the news? And just shot with a rifle 10 people? It's just terrible, some of the things that we're seeing in our world today. And it becomes more common and uh, more frequent, right, And the times in which we live and my heart goes out to those who have lost loved ones and how tragic it would be your life is taken from somebody that's very cruel and very evil. So let's remember the families in prayer and the loss that they have experienced. And so I wanted to uh, share, instead of doing a quiz tonight, I thought I would do um, a little mini presentation on a topic that I think comes up at a time like this in a series. And I think it will be helpful because it will kind of set the, uh, it's one of those truths that we want to look at because when we talk on Tuesday night, you'll see, oh, okay, I understand about that as well. And it really is the subject of baptism. I talked a little bit about that last night, the topic of baptism. And it's interesting, I, it's really surprising for, to me, really, what happened in the church and what the church has done when it comes to baptisms. Um, you know, the Bible is pretty clear about baptism. And so I just wanted to uh, read some text. Of course, this is Nicodemus when he came and met with Jesus one night. You know that in John chapter 3. And he, the Holy Spirit was drawing him, and he met with Jesus, and Jesus answered him, surprisingly, he said, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That's a pretty important statement, right? So we want to understand what that means, to be born of the water, born of the Spirit, so that we can enter into the kingdom of God. So born of the water is what? That is uh, baptism, right? And uh, born of, of, the, of the water, but the born of the Spirit, what is that? That is the Holy Spirit coming and bringing the conversion of the heart. You know, because we're born with corruptible hearts, right? We're born with fallen natures, and we have to be born again, right? We have to be born again Christians. So we need to be born of the water, born of the Spirit. So let's look more of born of the water and what it symbolizes. So this is Romans chapter 6, verses 3 through 6. And Jesus is talking, I mean, Paul is talking about baptism. Do you not know that as many of us we're baptized into Christ Jesus. We're baptized into his death. Therefore, we were buried with him through what? Baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, 
Even so, we should also walk in the newness of life. And so baptism really is the way we remember the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, right? Because what we do is we go into the water. And by the way, there is a, a baptistry behind that screen. If you're wondering, there is a baptistry here in the church. But you go into the water, and you go underneath the water, right? And what does that symbolize when you go underneath the water? You're dying, right? Dying to the old. The old Vic is dying. And then you come up, and that's what Paul is talking about. You come up out of the water, clean, forgiven, washed, right? Your sins have been washed away, but you are resurrected into a new life in Christ. And so it's a perfect representation of the resurrection that happens in our lives. We die to the old, raised to the new. And so baptism is symbolic of the death, burial, and resurrection. Now, the word itself, baptism, when Jesus says go and baptize, the Greek word is baptizo. And the word means to dip or to immerse. It means to go underneath the water. So when he says go and baptize, he says go and dip, go underneath the water. Because of what it symbolizes, you're dying to the old and you're being raised into the new life. And so Jesus, of course, set the example for us. Uh, he didn't have to be baptized. He was perfect. He had never sinned. But we always follow his example. And so what did Jesus do? He went into the water. John the Baptist baptized him. And he came up out of the water. And the Bible says that the Holy Spirit came upon him in the form of a dove. And so when Jesus was baptized, of course, uh, there was water. Then that is something that John the baptizer did. He would find a body of water, a river, and he was uh, baptizing people. That's why he was known as John the Baptist. Uh, he looked for places that were sufficient, that were, where there was sufficient depth of water to immerse individuals. And so you find different places in Scripture where that is the case. Acts chapter 8, verse 36, the eunuch, he's coming back, and he's been studying the prophecies and uh, the scrolls from Isaiah, and he began to understand that something significant just happened in Jerusalem with Jesus. He was trying to understand all that. Verse 36, now as they went down the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said to Philip, he had suddenly appeared to him, see, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? So there was a body of water. He went and was baptized uh, there in the body of water. That's a great attitude to have, right? <clears throat> what hinders me? What stops me from being baptized? That's a great response. Uh, verse 37, then Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So he commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. Okay, so I think it's very clear from Scripture. What is the mode of baptism? What is that? It's through immersion, right? So where did some of these other practices come from? Well, this is faith of our fathers. Uh, talking about, again, this is James Cardinal Gibbons, what happened in the church uh, during the Dark Ages. For several centuries after the establishment of Christianity, baptism was usually confirmed by immersion. But since the 20th uh, since not the 20th century, since the 12th century, the practice of baptism by infusion has prevailed, as this manner is attended with less inconvenience than baptism by immersion. So we see that baptism by immersion was done less and less over time because it became inconvenient in the church. And so we see that a change started taking place. Now, when you look at the churches back in, um, in history, here's in the 4th century, they were still doing what? They were still doing baptism by immersion, right? Here's a baptistry in St. John's Church in Ephesus. That's in the 4th century. Here's an African mural, and it shows that they're being baptized in a body of water in the 4th century. And then you see the Lateran Palace in the 4th century, a large um, bathtub, you might say. And they were baptized in that. Um, and then we have this... Hagia Sophia in the 6th century, this church was built by Emperor Justus, Justinian. And it was once the largest Christian church in the world. And one of the dome buildings houses a large baptistry. 
And so Vladimir the Great in the 10th century, um, he was converted to Christianity and he was baptized in Kiev and he was baptized by immersion. And so then you have the Leaning Tower of Pisa in the 12th century. Um, it's, here's the bell tower for the cathedral, but next to it um, has a building that has uh, a large baptistry. Uh, this is 1,100 years after Christ. So baptism by immersion was done for a long time. And it wasn't until we came later that a change took place as we moved past the 12th century. Notice it says the immersion of the candidate represents the death of Christ. While he is under the water, the burial of Christ is being represented. When he comes out of the water, the resurrection is represented. Yeah, that is good. But notice we go on. Um, it says here, Baptism may be given not only by immersion, but also by a fusion of water or sprinkling with it. But it is the safe way to baptize by immersion because that is the common custom. So we see that a new method was starting to be introduced in the 12th century. And it was at the Council of Ravenna, the church in 1311, that sprinkling and pouring were accepted as methods of baptism. And so in the Protestant Reformation, many of the prominent leaders recognized that changing the method of baptism had been a mistake. So that was part of, you had these uh, Protestant churches branching off because of this and other reasons. John Wesley, the founder of Methodist Church, he says, I believe it is a duty to observe so far as I can to baptize by what? By immersion. And so you have here John Calvin, who started the Presbyterian Church, a, a Protestant church that came off. The very word baptize, however, signifies to immerse, and it is certain that immersion was the practice of the ancient church. And so then you have Martin Luther, who started the Lutheran Church. On this account, I could wish that such as are to be baptized should be completely, what, immersed into the water, according to the meaning of the word and to the significance of the ordinance, as also, without a doubt, it was instituted by Christ. So... Here, the reformers, they looked and said, what the church is doing with sprinkling and pouring, that's not really what the Bible says. We need to go back to immersion. And that is really what the word means, to be baptized, to be immersed. And so what are the steps? If we feel like we haven't been baptized or, or thinking about it, what are some of the steps to baptism? Number one is, of course, repentance, right? That is key, repentance. And you see here in Acts 2, verse 38, then Peter said unto them, repent and be what? Baptized. You know what repent means, right? It means uh, feeling sorrow for sin. The Holy Spirit moves on our hearts, and we want to have a turning of the ways, and we want to live a new life in Christ. That's repentance. That's an important step towards baptism. Of course, step number two is to believe, right? And Paul says here in Acts chapter 19, verse 4, then Paul said, uh, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Jesus Christ. So you have to believe. So you repent, you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and then you have to understand, and that is important, because notice it says Matthew 28, 19 and 20, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, do what? Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. So if you're going to make a decision for baptism, you want to understand what that's all about, right? Who are you following? What are his teachings? And so there's a certain element that we need to understand of Scripture and salvation and repentance and, and other things. Um, and so I know that during the dark ages, baptizing infants became very popular. It became something that was done shortly after a child was born. Is that a biblical practice to baptize infants? Well, can infants follow those three steps, yes or no? Can they repent? No. They're too young. Can they believe? No. Can they understand? No. Okay, so um, the Bible does say uh, about dedications of children, not to baptize children, but uh, just as Jesus, he was dedicated in the temple as an infant. That's what the Bible encourages us to do, to dedicate the child to the Lord and to pray over them. But there's nothing about infant baptism, okay? That comes years later from the church. 
And so this is a question I think is really good to answer. Is it ever appropriate to be rebaptized? Is there ever a time, a situation? Well, we do have a biblical incident, instance, instance where that is, Acts 19. Um, notice this is verses 1 through 5. And it happened while Paulus was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus. And finding some disciples, he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So they said to him, we have not so much as heard whether or not there's a Holy Spirit. And he said unto them, into what then were you baptized? So they said into John's baptism. Then Paul said, John indeed baptized with a baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him, he would come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. Now, pay close attention to this. These people did have a valid baptism. Did they have this? Well, Paul is encouraging them because they didn't really have a full understanding that there's a time and a situation where we want to be rebaptized because we've had fuller truth. We've had fuller understanding of God's word. And that's an example in Acts 19. When they heard this, notice, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So they were baptized again in their commitment to deeper truth than what they had already known. And sometimes, by the way, um, you know, baptism is like a marriage, right? And sometimes we are not faithful to those marriage vows. When we make that decision and we're baptized and we drift away, that's another example. And we want to recommit our lives or, quote, get remarried to Christ, right? That might be a time and a situation where we might want to be rebaptized. So one time it would be if we had full understanding of truth. Another time is when we've drifted and we have a whole tr true to our commitment to Jesus and we are um, rebaptized to have that renewal in our marriage. And so baptism is a beautiful thing. I just wanted to highlight it because it often comes up. And it, it's, it's just that new start that Jesus gives. You bury the past and you rise to a new, brand new life. We're a new creature. What a wonderful ordinance that Jesus has given to the church. And so if anybody is thinking, we're going to have uh, special baptisms in the future. So if someone is feeling led with that, uh, let Pastor uh, Ramon or myself know. We can talk about that. But that's a special time in a person's life. And the Holy Spirit may put that on your heart. But sprinkling, my point is sprinkling and pouring is not a practice that you find in the Bible. And that came years later in the 1300s by the church. Now, we're seeing that there's a lot of things the church did, right, during the Dark Ages, and this is just one of those that we see the change taking place. Okay? So hopefully that was helpful. That's our quiz for tonight. So let me ask you, this is our question for the quiz. Is baptism uh, from the Bible, does it say it's baptism through sprinkling, true or false? False, right? It's through immersion. And this is a one last question. Is baptism a symbol, a symbol of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ? That's true, right? Okay, so you passed the quiz, so we're good. <laughs> so, all right. So I know that several have been coming. Uh, hopefully you've, getting your, you've gotten your free Bible. I think most of you have by this point. Um, <clears throat> Tuesday night, so we're taking a break tomorrow night. And we have two really important lectures this coming week on Tuesday night. We're looking at the four horsemen of the apocalypse. I really do like this lecture. It helps to make sense of a lot of things as we look at the, the white, the red, the black, and the pale horse and how it uh, helps us to understand what's happened in the church. And then we're going to look on Wednesday night, Babylon and the bride. And then we have our last lecture, which will be next Sabbath morning, the last night on earth at 11 o'clock. So I hope that you have that on your calendar as well. And so we are coming to the end of this phase, but as you met and heard from Pastor Mark Finley last night, we have a new series that's coming for just one week. I'm excited, and I'm planning on being there and helping out. It'll be a one-week series with Pastor Ted Wilson at the Warren Performing Arts Center. And that's a beautiful, by the way, I don't know if you've seen that, but that's a beautiful theater. And uh, so there's going to be music, powerful preaching from God's Word on the book of Revelation. And he'll cover things that we haven't covered. And, uh, you know, there's so much you can cover in the book of Revelation. And we're just kind of getting some of the main highlights. 
So, Pastor Ramon, I think we're going to do our drawing again for tonight. There we go. As we've gone through the series here, we've run out of nice gift bags. So, it's a little plain today, but I can assure you that what's inside is just as nice as in previous days. So, one of you is going to get this tonight, and if you've gotten it before, we're, we're getting to the point now where most of you probably have received it. So, if you've gotten it before, you may want to pass, pass it on to somebody else, but let's see who it is tonight. The winner is 251. We have a winner. You know, I thought it'd be nice, kind of, as we transition to the next topic, if you just wouldn't mind just turning to somebody and greeting them tonight. We're all friends here, and we've been here night after night, but it'd be nice just to say hello to somebody next to you, and then we'll get into our next topic. You know, it is funny how, just like in church, we have our favorite pews, right? <laughs> so it's easy to spot where people are because it's where we typically sit. So, all right. Well, I think that this topic tonight is a really important topic. And remember, we talked about death on Friday night. And then on Sabbath morning, we talked about the millennium. And so this is kind of the last piece of that three-part presentation because you're probably wondering, okay, what happens to those who reject Jesus? What happens to them? So we're going to try to answer that in our presentation tonight. Okay, so let's pray as we open God's Word, shall we? Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come and study your Word once more. And we ask that your Holy Spirit will guide in our understanding of your truths and Lord, these are very important topics, and we see that every topic is um, something that points us to you and your character. And I know this one in particular has been distorted, and it affects the way we see you. So please help us in our understanding. We know that all things are from you, and so we need understanding from above. So guide us now with your Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so if you remember on Friday night, we saw that the Bible teaches that death is a what? It is a sleep, right? The scriptures refer to death over 70 times as sleep. After sleeping, the Bible tells us the dead are raised, the dead in Christ are raised to immortality and to eternal life at the second coming of Christ. We saw that in 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, we, we saw that at the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, it says there in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, the, the, the dead will arise and we will receive immortality. That's 1 Corinthians 15. And then 1 Thessalonians 4, we saw that the dead in Christ arise and we who are alive shall be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air and thus be with the Lord. Those are wonderful passages of scripture and we are looking forward to that day, aren't we, when Jesus comes. Now, we're not looking forward to the grave, but we are looking forward to... We're meeting Jesus in the sky, right? Because that is our hope. So the question is, what about the wicked? What about the people who reject the gift of salvation? What happens to them? As with other things, as you have discovered, there are a lot of theories. And you have to wonder where people are getting their information. Here's a book. Now, this is a book that was written 200 years ago for little kids on the subject of hell. Okay? And notice what we find. This is written by Mr. J. Furness. 
Now, no pun intended, okay? All right, so the topic is the side of hell, okay? So this was what's written 200 years ago. Look into this little prison. In the middle of it, there is a boy, a young man. He is silent. Despair is on him. He stands straight up. His eyes are burning like two burning coals. Two long flames come out of his ears. His breathing is difficult. Sometimes he opens his mouth and a breath of blazing fire rolls out of it. But listen, there is a sound just like that of a kettle boiling. Is it really a kettle boiling? No, then what is it? The blood is boiling in the scalded veins of that boy. The brain is boiling and bubbling in his head. The marrow is boiling in his bones. Friends, is this what God does with unrepentant sinners? Is this an accurate dis- description? Well, it is, certainly is what some Christians have been preaching for several hundred years. And that's what Robert Ingersoll's father told him in his youth. Do you, I don't know if you've ever heard of Robert Ingersoll. He was a notorious atheist, kind of like the Richard Dawkins of, our, of his day. He spent his adult life mocking Christianity. But guess what? Ingersoll's father was a minister who told his son stories like what we just read. Listen, Robert, he said, if you're not a good boy, God is going to torture you forever in the fires of hell. You're going to twist in pain and scream out loud and suffer without any kind of relief. Ingersoll, growing up hearing those words, said in his heart, if that's what God is like, then I hate God. I want nothing to do with him. And he spent his rest of his life fighting God, fighting the Bible. Much like I said, Richard Dawkins and Sam Harris today. So guess what? At some point, all critics of God come back to the subject of hell. They ask, how can a good God do such a horrible thing? And I think that's a pretty good question to ask, don't you think? How could a God who purportedly gave his life to save us punish people in hell with no hope of escape? Or does he? We need to see what the Bible says about this critical, important subject. Does the devil work for God, torturing the wicked? Now, most comic books, most cartoons, picture the devil in a manner like we see on the screen. And you see what he kind of looks like, what he's portrayed. He has these wings, and he has these um, horns and a pointed tail. He's dressed in red, and he has a pitchfork in his hand. Now, by the way, you know, that's not at all an accurate description of Lucifer. Remember we read in Ezekiel 28, he was a beautiful angel. He's a fallen angel. He looks nothing like that. That's from mythology. But, you know, they portray him as having this pitchfork and stoking people in this fire, and he's in charge of hell. And he is basically working for God. And I'm sure you've seen this description or this description But is it anywhere close to reality? One day, a little girl told her mother a bald-faced lie. Mom was shocked that her little sweet angel would lie to her. So she decided to scare her into being honest. Here's what she said. If you ever do that again, a big tall man with flaming red eyes and two horns is going to come and take you away and make you work in a coal mine underground for 100 years. So tell me. You'll never lie to your mother again, will you? No, ma'am, she said. I wouldn't dare because you tell them better than I do. Well, let's see who was right. The mother or the daughter? Let's look at some biblical facts. What does the Bible say about hell? Number one, I want to be clear, it is a reality. Notice what we find in Revelation 20 and verse 15. And anyone that found written in the book of life was cast where? Into the lake of fire. So clearly some people will not be going to heaven. 
clearly some people will be in the lake of fire. God won't force anyone to be in heaven, right? God won't write anyone's name in the book of life against their will. There was a story told about a man who loved gambling. He heard about a boat that would take you to an island full of casinos. So he booked a ticket, but halfway there, he noticed that the boat was full of kids all singing Bible songs. So he went to the captain and he asked, he said, why are these little kids going to the casino? That doesn't make sense. Oh, sir, you must have made a mistake. This isn't the boat that's going to the casino. This boat's headed for the big vacation Bible school on a different island. The man panicked. You've got to turn this boat around. I don't want to go to vacation Bible school. Take me back right away, please. And the captain said, I can't. I'm not going to disappoint all these kids because you got on the wrong boat. So the man was stuck. And a whole day of little kids and all of them talking about Bible stories and singing Bible songs. There was no alcohol, no blackjack, no roulette table. And he was absolutely miserable. Why? Because he loved gambling and he hated the Bible. And that's why God won't force us to go into heaven. If you hated God, if you hated living with him forever, why would you want to be in heaven? Eternal life would be completely miserable for you, right? Where would you buy the liquor? Where would you find pornography or drugs? Where would you do what you like to do here? So hell is a reality according to the Bible. There's that lake of fire. So I want to be clear, there's a lake of fire that the Bible talks about. Number two, that the Bible says it was not attended for us. How do we know that? Notice Revelation 20, verse 15. Then he will also say to those on the left hand, depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire, prepared for whom? The devil and his angels. So who was the hellfire prepared for? Hell was prepared for not human beings, but if you follow the devil, you end up going where he goes. It's true of the angels, true of us, so we need to be careful who we follow, amen? And so we see number three. So first, it's a reality. Number two, it was not intended for us. And number three, it's not yet burning. Now, this is contrary to what many have thought. Many believe that hell is burning right now somewhere in the center of the earth, somewhere below us. Maybe you've heard this story. It was in the National Enquirer magazine. A Russian oil drig drilled too far into the ground. They broke into what they claim hell. And they heard screams of people, I mean, they heard screams of people burning. Did the National Choir ever confirm the Bible? Or did it contradict it? Notice what the Bible says in Matthew 13, 24 through 30. The kingdom of heaven, now this is a parable that Jesus told. And it tells us a lot about this subject. Notice, it says, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept... His enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? He said to them, An enemy has done this. The servants said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, No, lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and at the time of the harvest, notice the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. So as you know, Jesus told many stories to illustrate important truths. They take careful thought and prayerful reflection really to fully understand them. But in this case, I believe that Jesus made it very clear, and he explained every part of the story, which is kind of unusual. But you read later in the chapter, he says this, verses 37 and 42. He's answered and said to them, he who sows the good seed is whom? The son of man. The field is the world. So things are really clear here. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom. But the tares are the sons of the, what? Of the wicked one. 
the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is when? At the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. So this is a story about the second coming of Christ. We know that because Revelation calls Christ's return a harvest. Scripture says all Christ's angels come and they gather up the believers. There's a great harvest that takes place. And notice as we read on, Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be when? Notice, it's very important. When will it be? At the end of this age. So the Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness, and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. So notice the words of Jesus. He says the furnace burns after the second coming of Christ, after the harvest takes place. You and I are caught up to meet the Lord in the air. The wicked are burned in the fire sometime after that. And we've talked about that when we talked about the millennium. So based on the story, no one could be burning in hell right now. The devil and his angels are not there. Neither are there any human followers of the devil there. So they're not yet burning. And that's the final thing that we see here. It burns at the end of the age after the second coming. So first, hellfire is a biblical reality. Number two, it was not originally intended for the human race. Number three, it hasn't started burning yet. Number four, it burns at the end of this age after the second coming. So these are the things that we know for sure from Scripture. So now, where does hellfire burn? Under our feet? In a remote corner of the universe? At the earth's core? Well, let's let the Bible tell us. This is Revelation 20, verses 7 through 9. We talked about this on, on um, Saturday morning. Um, and we talked about the thousand years. It says, now when the thousand years have expired, at the end of the thousand years, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to, bat- to gather them together to battle. They're trying to take over that city of God, as we talked about, whose number is the sand of the sea. So there's so many wicked, the number is the sand of the sea. They went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints in the beloved city. And then notice this. And fire did what? Came down from God out of heaven and did what? And devoured them. So where are the wicked devoured? On the earth from the fire that comes from God. It burns on the earth. Why does God use fire? That's a good question. Probably the same reason that when police find drugs or they find marijuana, they like to burn up the marijuana plantation. They want to annihilate annihilate it, never to grow again never to rise up again. And so the fire that we see is a permanent solution to a temporary problem, which is sin. Fire that comes from God, that fire that devours the wicked, destroys sin, destroys sinners completely and entirely, so nothing sinful and no sinners left to grow again. You bury something and someone will dig it up. You throw it in the water and it will wash ashore, burn it, and it is completely disintegrated and permanently gone. Notice what God plans to do one day. This is Revelation 21, verse 4. And God will wipe every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. So what is God going to do? He's going to put a permanent end to misery, amen? He's going to put sin, stop sin in its tracks. No more pain, no more suffering, no more tears. Why? Because God can't stand it. He breaks, it breaks his heart to see his children suffer like they have. He's waiting long enough to give everybody an opportunity to be saved, amen? He wants everybody to be part of his kingdom, but then God brings it all to an end. And he makes a new heaven and a new earth. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. 
So how long will hellfire burn? A lot of us were told as kids that hell will burn forever and ever and ever and ever. But if that were true, would suffering really be eliminated? Or would there be people in God's universe still shedding tears? Notice again, Revelation 20 and verse 9, and fire came down from God out of heaven and did what? And devoured them. So what does it mean to devour? Well, I think we know, don't we? I like pizza. Does anybody like pizza here? And if you're hungry and you go home and you put a couple of slices in front of you, what are you going to do? I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to probably devour those pieces, right? Uh, devouring means that I don't keep eating and eating and eating, right, forever. It means that there's nothing left after I eat them up, right? And that's what the hellfire is. The hellfire that comes from God devours the wicked, and there's nothing left to burn. And then when God does that, he eliminates sin, sinners from the earth. He makes a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. Now, I want to look at some scriptures. Now, this is very insightful. Look at what the Bible describes, this fire that comes from God. This is Malachi 4.1. For behold, talking about the wicked, what will happen in the end for the wicked. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, and all the proud, yes, all who do wickedly, will be what? Stubble. Stubble is short, dry grass that's easily burned. The wicked are not like steel or asbestos that keeps burning and burning. And it goes on. It says, and the day which is coming shall burn what? Burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, that will leave them neither root nor branch. Now, that doesn't sound like a fire that has limitless fuel, right? That it keeps burning and burning. Not at all. And it says, you shall trample the wicked, for they shall be ashes Under the soles of your feet on the day that I do this, says the Lord of hosts. When something is burned up, what's left? Ashes, right? And according to the Bible, that's all that's left of the wicked. And we read this in Psalm 21, verses 9 and 10. You shall make them as a fiery oven in the time of your anger. The Lord shall swallow them up in his wrath. And the fire shall, what again? Devour them. Their offspring you shall destroy from the earth, and their descendants from among the sons of men. So destroy is the same idea as devour, right? God is not going to torture the wicked forever and ever. He's going to destroy the wicked. And that's what we find here. Psalm 37, 20, another passage. But the wicked shall what? Perish. And the enemies of the Lord shall be as the fat of the lambs. They shall consume into smoke. They shall vanish away. So what happens when a fire goes out, whether it's a candle or a forest fire? Smoke what? Smoke rises for a while, right? And then the smoke does what? It disappears. And we see that's what happens with the wicked. Psalm 145, verse 20. The Lord preserves all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. So let's just stop for a moment and think through this very carefully. Many of you are parents. And let's say that your child refuses to clean his or her room. Did you ever run into that with your kids? I know we did. You walk in and it's a mess. And there are toys all over the floor. And you step on a Lego block. So you tell your child, clean up your room. And you go away. Then you come back in an hour and now the room is messier than ever. I told you to clean your room. This is your last chance. I'm coming back in 30 minutes. If your room isn't clean, then you're going to get it. And when you come back, the room is still a mess. So you spank your child. Well, there's 11 toys on the floor, so you spank your child one hour for every toy. So you have an 11-hour spanking. Is that something a good parent would do? No. No. Friends, it seems someone has been trying to deceive us. Fallen angels who imbibed Satan's false view of God are trying to get us to see the Father in the same way. The devil lied to them, and now he is lying to us. Listen to me. God is not a monster. 
The Bible says the fire burns out. It comes to an end. Does that make sense? This is Isaiah 47, verse 14. Behold, they shall be a stubble. The fire shall burn them. They shall not deliver themselves from the power of the flame. It shall not be a coal to be warmed by, nor a fire to sit before. So how do you reconcile a fire that never goes out with verses like this? Fire is so thorough that even the devil himself is destroyed. You know, it really bothers some people. They say, well, okay, the wicked, they get punished, but the devil seems to not have the same fate. He's in charge of hell, and he's poking people forever. They wonder, why doesn't the biggest perpetrator of suffering seem to get, scot free, get off scot-free? Well, guess what? He doesn't. This is what we find in Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 18 and 19. And it's an imagery talking about Lucifer. And we read this earlier in Ezekiel 28, talking about the fallen angel, it says, therefore, and this is his consequence, God reveals what's going to happen to Satan, the Lucifer. Therefore, I brought fire from your mist. It devoured you, and I turned you to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all who saw you. So this is God speaking to Lucifer. All who knew you among the peoples are astonished at you. You have become a whore and shall be what? No more for how long? Forever. Everything evil goes away, including the devil. Now, I'd like to say amen tonight to that. Satan doesn't work for God. He is not in charge of hell. The Bible says that he will be burned with that hellfire, that he will not exist anymore. Friends, it's really tragic that we painted such a distorted picture of God. Sincere and godly ministers are brought into something that millions have found it impossible to reconcile. Notice, here's Jonathan Edwards. I don't know if you've ever heard of Jonathan Edwards. He, he was a famous preacher during the Great Awakening, and he preached one of the most famous sermons. You may have read this in your um, English class. The sinners in the hands of an angry God. Remember that? I don't know if you've read that. But listen to what he said. This was the theology of the day. He says, The view of the wicked being tormented in hell will be a font of happiness for the saints throughout eternity. It will make paradise even more precious to them when they see their loved ones suffering in that way. The saints won't have any compassion for the wicked in hellfire as they suffer inexplicable pain. It will give them happiness to see them burn there. Can you picture the redeemed saints and the holy angels gathering on a Saturday night to watch the wicked burn? Will that be heaven's form of entertainment? But friends, that's what some have actually said. I mean, I'm just reading what they preach. That's a, one of the most famous sermons that you can read. Sinners in the hands of an angry God. Samuel Hopkins wrote this, this display of divine character and glory will be in favor of the redeemed. Talking about, again, this uh, eternal torment. And most are entertaining and give the highest pleasure to those who love God. Should the eternal torment and fires be extinguished, it would be in great measure put an end to the happiness and the glory of the blessed. Can you imagine I mean, when you read that, it kind of makes your blood boil in a way, doesn't it? That people were saying this about God. Notice what the Bible says. Just put it in the right perspective. This is Ezekiel 33, verse 11. As I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. That is in such contrast to the quotes we just read. I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Friends, if you read the Bible carefully, you can only conclude the destruction of the wicked, and it's the hardest thing that God has to do. He won't enjoy it in the least. In fact, Scripture calls it, and that's why I call this the, the subtitle, it's God's strange act when he destroys the wicked in the very end. Look at this, Isaiah 28, 21 for the Lord will rise up as at Mount Perizim. He will be angry as in the valley of Gibeon. 
that he may do his work, his awesome work, and to bring to pass his act, his unusual act. You see, we made a mess of this planet. We sinned, and we've seen all the suffering in this world. But God didn't leave it for somebody else to clean up. He went to the cross, praise God, to purchase our salvation. And in the end, he personally cleans up our mess by purifying the earth with fire. Notice Ezekiel 31, 33, 11 again. As I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Friends, I am thankful that God is going to take care of the sin problem. God is going to take care of the sinners. He's going to take care of the devil. And he's going to clean up the mess that we've made on this planet. So there are some words that I'd like for us to look at in the Bible. Because some will ask, what about eternal fire? Doesn't the Bible say something about that? And what about burning forever and ever? Does it say something like that? Well, let's take a look at those words that are used in the Bible for hell and how they're translated. The first word is sheol. In the Old Testament, the Hebrew word sheol is sometimes translated hell, but it simply means the grave. It's not a place of eternal torment, as you read, because the Bible says that Jacob went to Sheol, and when Job was suffering, he actually wished that he could go to Sheol. And so it simply means the grave. So the, the second word is Gehana. And in the New Testament, Gehana was sometimes translated hell, but Gehenna was a reference to the garbage dump outside the city of Jerusalem. It was the place where they burned trash and sometimes the bodies of criminals. Nobody was ever tortured there. It was simply an ancient incinerator. That's where the dead and the garbage were burned. Number three is Hades. You'll find that sometimes translated as Hades in the Bible. It's the ref, roughly it's the Greek equivalent of the Hebrew word, Hebrew word Sheol, and it simply means, again, the grave. And then the fourth one is the only one time that it appears in Scripture is the second Peter chapter 2, verse 4, is Tartarus. And it appears that one time, and it refers to a place where the fallen angels wait for judgment. Those are the words translated as hell. Now, let's take that information and look at some of the passages in the Bible. This is Mark chapter 9, verses 43 and 44. So we want to take the majority of texts that we've looked at and look at those in light of these smaller minority texts. We'll look at the texts that are clear and look at the ones that may not be as clear. So this is Mark 9, 43 and 44. <clears throat> Jesus says, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter into a life maimed rather than having two hands to go to hell. And the word there is Gehenna, like we just showed there. Um, that place outside of Jerusalem that they burn up the trash and burn up those dead bodies. And it says, into the fire that shall never be quenched, where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. So does that mean when it says the fire of hell will never be quenched, does that mean it goes on without end? The fire in Gehenna outside of Jerusalem could only burn as long as there was fuel. Unquenchable in this context simply means it can't be put out until there is nothing. You can't put it out until there's nothing left to burn. It's kind of like a house fire. If your house is on fire, um, you know, it has to have elements to burn up. And once it burns it all up, then it's all done and complete. And the worms eat up all the bodies until the carcasses are gone. And so eternal means it burns as long as there's something left to burn. Okay? And so Jeremiah, let's look at this. Jeremiah 17, verse 27. Here's an example of unquenchable fire. He's talking about the city of Jerusalem. I will kindle a fire in its gates, and it shall devour the palaces of Jerusalem, and it shall not be what? Quenched, right? So he's speaking of the judgment coming upon the rebellious Jews in Jerusalem, and so that fire was kindled. So the question is, is Jerusalem still burning tonight? Yes or no? 
Of course it's not burning tonight, right? The city burned and the fire went out. But it was unquenchable because when the fire comes as a judgment from God, it's going to do what it's designed to do, and then it will be complete. So it's not burning forever and ever. So this is Matthew 25, verse 41. It says, Then he will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you curse, into the everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. So does everlasting fire mean it will never go out? Well, that would contradict all the other verses that we just looked at. We know the devil and the wicked will be reduced to ashes, so it must be that the effect of the fire is everlasting. And let me illustrate. It's another example. This is Jude 1.7. This is talking about the eternal fire. Um, you know what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah, right? A uh, city filled with wickedness, and we see that fire and brimstone came down upon the city. And Jude is referring to it, so it says, As Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of what? Eternal fire. Are Sodom and Gomorrah still on fire tonight? No, the effects of what happened to those cities will be eternal, right? Those cities will never exist again in God's universe. So the effects of it, have been eternal. It's not a fire that keeps burning and burning and burning forever. So hopefully that makes sense. These verses are reminding us that God's solution to sin is a permanent solution. So look at this, Revelation 20, verse 10. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Now, doesn't this prove, some will say, doesn't this prove that the torture goes on and on without any end? Again, that was set that in contradiction to all the other scriptures that we just wor warned about, that they'll be devoured, they'll be burned up, they'll become ashes, they'll become stubble upon the earth. So how can this passage be reconciled with all the other uh, passages that we just looked at? In the Bible, the length of forever depends on the nature of the thing you're talking about. When you're talking about God and the redeemed, it means life without end. Because with God, then he is immortal, and he gives that gift of immortality. But when it talks about mortal beings, it means as long as they last. So let me give you an example in the Bible. This is 1 Samuel 1, verse 22. But Hannah did not go up. You know the story of Hannah. She was praying for a child, and she wasn't able to have one. But finally, God blessed her. And Samuel prayed over her, but she comes back, and she says, but Hannah did not go up, for she said to her husband, she's so appreciative of having a child, not until the child is weaned that I will, I'm sorry, Eli prayed over her, Samuel was her child, not until the child is weaned, then I will take him that he may appear before the Lord and remain there how long? Forever. And his mortal state Samuel's lifespan was limited, right? Hannah dedicated her little boy to serve God at the temple all his earthly life. That earthly lifetime was called forever by Samuel's mother, Hannah. Okay, do you follow me? And so she clarifies later what she's talking about later in, in verse 28. Therefore, I have lent them to the Lord. And what does the next part say? As long as... As he lives, he shall be lent to the Lord. Obviously, um, Samuel's not serving there today in the temple. So as long as his life shall last. So that's what the Bible means when it talks about forever. You know, it's like when you take a trip. We kind of say that in a way today, don't we? In, in a way, there's an ending time. You know, when we went up to Michigan and we drove, it seemed like it took forever. It didn't really mean like we're driving, 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 right? As long as time shall last and as long as the person shall live. And there is an ending to that. Another example in the Bible, this is Jonah. I love the story of Jonah, don't you? Swallowed up in the belly of a whale. He, run, he ran from God and God's will. And they threw him over the ship and this big um, whale, a big fish comes, swallows him up. Jonah is talking about what it's like to be inside the belly of the whale. I, that wouldn't be a pleasant experience, would it? It'd be smelly, it'd be stinky. 
it would not be a place where I want to be for just even a short time, right? But this is what Jonah writes about his experience. He says, I went down to the moorings of the mountains, the earth with its bars closed behind me for how long? Forever. He's talking about being inside this whale. It's probably a whale, big fish with his ribs, whatever, the the bones, these bars that closed him, uh, around him. Notice how he describes his experience. He was actually there for how long? Three days, right? But for him, it seemed like forever. And it would seem like that for us. But obviously, there was an end to that time. Now, this is a pretty clear passage. And I don't want us to miss this. Talking about the fate of the wicked, that is not uh, like no end to it. I think just looking at this text and what Jesus did helps us understand what the uh, punishment of the wicked is. This is John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not, what? Perish, but have everlasting life. Perish doesn't mean tortured for eons without end. It means to cease to exist like perishable food. It decays over time. That's what perishable food does. When the process is complete, it is gone. That's the fate of the wicked. When Jesus died, he paid that price so that we wouldn't have to perish, but instead we can have eternal life. And so Revelation 21 verse 4 says, And God will wipe every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying, for there shall be... No more pain, for the former things have passed away. Friends, the devil contends that God is not fit to rule this universe. So he has to prove that God is unfit. He can't really do that. So what does he do? He works to deceive us about the character of God so that we will hate God as much as he does. How much, how does God answer this false charge? He gives Satan the time and the space to show that He's the real monster. The murder of Christ on the cross proves that Satan is a murderer and that God is merciful and gracious. Amen? The cross should answer every question that any of us might have on a topic like this. A doctor once described what happens in an emergency room. He said, it's awful when parents bring their child in and you're trying to recitate them and that tiny little body. They'll keep you, keep pushing you, saying, try harder, do it again. Don't lose my little boy. But then there comes a moment when it's too late. The child is lost. As a doctor, you keep pressing on their chest well past the moment when it's over. And then the parents see it. There's nothing more you can do And at that moment, they want you to stop. And friends, that's where we are. God loves everyone. He's doing everything he can to save us. Right now, he's pushing on their chest, wanting them to survive. But there comes a point in time where decisions are permanent, and it's too late. Then God stops trying to save and decides to put an end to all the misery And he makes uh, the fire that comes, burns the wicked, burns up the devil, puts an end to sin, puts an end to suffering. And from the ashes of the old earth and that fire, God makes a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. And there will be no more sin. And there will be no more Satan. And that we will live with him forever and ever. Do you trust a God that we see in the Bible? Do you see him as a God of love? He would sooner die himself than to see any one of us perish. His love for you is stronger than death itself. And some of you may be going through hard times right now. And it's so easy, and I've talked to many people through the years, and it's so easy to blame God. Why did this happen? God, why did this come to me? But tonight, I'm just appealing to trust God with all of your heart. And that one day, he's going to make all things right. 
justice will be served, mercy will be shown, God will be vindicated as a God of perfect love. Trust him with all your heart, even when your heart is hurting. Trust him, and he will take care of you. And one day soon, he's going to come back for us. And we're going to be meeting him in the sky. What a day of rejoicing that will be when we see Jesus again. So let us pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the truths of your word. And Lord, it's, it's amazing to see how Satan has distorted many things of Scripture to distort our view of who you are. And there have been many, many people who have become atheists and infidels because they can never reconcile a God who would just torture people and so have them suffer forever and ever and ever. But Lord, you have made it very clear from Scripture that you will clean up the mess on earth, that you will honor the choices that we've made, and that you will put an end to sin and to suffering. You will put an end to devil and his angel, evil angels. And that from the ashes of the old, of the burning up of the old, you will make a new heavens and a new earth. And Lord, that's where we want to be. That's the kingdom that we want to be part of. And so we thank you. And Lord, And when we're going through hard times, and many of us are in the days in which we live, help us to trust you. And help us not to blame you. And sometimes we don't make sense of everything, but when we keep our eyes on you, knowing that you are a God of love and a God of mercy, and that we, there's somebody that we can trust, we can give you our all. And I pray that that's what we'll do tonight. So Lord, be with us as we travel home, keep us safe, and bring us back again on Tuesday night. In Jesus' name. Well, thank you for coming, and we will see you on Tuesday night. So you have tomorrow night off, and if you have any questions, I'll be happy to try to answer them. God be with each of you.